All right, I want to ask you to give me 15, 20 minutes with, of your undivided attention. Can you do that? Uh, if you're using a phone for scripture, turn it off. We'll have it on the screen for you. I don't want you to be distracted at all. Uh, if you can refrain from going to the bathroom, please do. Uh, I know things happen, but help me today because uh, I have a sense of urgency that I haven't had in a long time. And this is something that I've been reminded not to take lightly. Everybody out here today is a soul, including myself. This week, I couldn't help but see that Russia and Ukraine are still at war with now Iran and North Korea joining them. Israel has elected Benjamin Netanyahu, their prime minister, great prime minister, who has said that he would most likely supply weapons to Ukraine to help them. And now Saudi Arabia has said that an imminent attack is coming to them from Iran, of all places, uh, through intelligence. And North Korea is flexing its muscle against South Korea. Um, and we have come beside of South Korea and said, you better not. China is flexing its muscle to the whole world. And if Israel gets involved in this war, I can tell you that we will be involved. And our country has never been in worse shape. Spiritually, morally, politically, economically, never. And it's just going to get worse. So I want to look at 2 Thessalonians this morning. Have your Bible. I want to go to chapter 2. I have seen a passage this week that I've never read it like this before. I've memorized it. I've quoted it. I've taught it. I've read it. But it's still something fresh that the Holy Spirit gave me this week. And it's amazing how he does that. And I said all that to say that Jesus Christ is coming. Amen. And it could very well be today. That's how imminent it is. It's how close we are. When this letter of 2 Thessalonians was written, the situation in the Thessalonian church was much the same as when Paul wrote his first letter. It is likely, therefore, that this letter was written only a few months after 1 Thessalonians, while Paul and Silas and Timothy were in Corinth during his second missionary journey. And the purpose of this letter is similar to 1 Thessalonians. Number one, to encourage Christ followers during a time of persecution. They were under major persecution as Christians. To challenge them to live a disciplined life and to work for a living. Boy, that would preach today, huh? And thirdly, to correct some misunderstandings about end-time events related to Christ's coming. That's why he's addressing them here in 2 Thessalonians. The main section of the letter deals with the end-time day of Christ, or the day of the Lord. When does that begin? It begins when the rapture of the church happens. And the day is not a single day, it's a period of time. Time of seven years, the Bible gives us a tribulation that will come upon the whole world. And it's coming. The period of time when God unleashes his severe end time judgments on the earth. And it appears from chapter 2, verse 2 of 2 Thessalonians that some in Thessalonica were claiming, listen, that a teacher, a false prophet, or even a letter had been sent to them with Paul's forged signature saying that the day of the Lord has already begun. That they were already living during the time of tribulation. And they were concerned. And Paul corrects this in this letter about the day of the Lord and the misunderstanding by clarifying that three major events have to happen before it initiates. Number one, a major apostasy, a falling away. I know people preach an end time revival, but listen to me today. The Bible says that in this day which we're living, that there will be a falling away from the faith. We're seeing it all over the world, but mainly where the light is shining the most in the place we call America. Fifteen years ago, over 80% of Americans said they were Christians. Today, it's almost 60%. And going down by the year, by the decade. With each decade, with each generation, the morale in this country gets worse, not better. So it's happening. Secondly, God's current restraint 
will be lifted. There's something restraining the Antichrist from being revealed. It's not the Holy Spirit. He is omnipresent. He's God. The Holy Spirit will be here for the tribulation period because during that time, many people will be saved from every tongue, tribe, and nation. And they can't be saved unless the Holy Spirit draws them. See? So the restrainer is the church. And when the restrainer is lifted, that begins the day of the Lord. And thirdly, the man of sin will be revealed. I'm talking about a major charismatic political, financial, religious leader who will deceive the world. Not just Israel and the Middle East, but the whole world. And this country is bait for that kind of thing. You had people who would wait in line for six hours to hear an arrogant businessman running for president, and they won't even come to the house of God. You've got a country that's conditioned for that type of deception. Paul also sternly rebukes those in the church who are using the expectation of Christ's return to quit their jobs. And in chapter 3, in fact, he says, if you don't work, you don't eat. Because they said, well, since this is the day of the Lord, Christ is coming, I'm going to quit my job. And he says, if you don't work, you don't eat. The importance of living a disciplined life. And earning a wage. But I want to look at chapter 2. These verses strike a fear in me, to be honest. Because I don't know that I've done an adequate job for you. But verse 9, even him, referring to the Antichrist, whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. <laughs> and for this cause, God shall send them. God will do it. Send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. From the very beginning of creation, the central issue in humanity's relationship with God has been the choice either to reject God or receive the truth of His Word and love and obey Him. That choice will continue to be pivotal in this last day. Listen to me today. Salvation, which is rescue from spiritual death, salvation that brings you at one with God, only happens to the people who fully surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. Not people who attend church. Not people who said a prayer when they were a child. The person who fully surrenders their life and heart to Jesus Christ. Where there is an evidence of fruit and an evidence of change and transformation in their lives. And if that doesn't define you today, you are not saved. And according to this passage, if you are left behind after the restrainer has come, after the church is out of the earth, you don't have a chance. You don't have a chance. Anybody that says, well, if I don't make the rapture, I'll, I know I won't serve the Antichrist. You're who I'm talking to. The person who isn't fully committed to Christ today, I'm talking to you. Little foxes that spoil the vine. Just because you attend or just because you go to a church and you said a prayer and you're not perfect, well, I'm talking to you. Because he's coming back for a church that's spotless, righteous, and holy. I didn't say perfect, but fully committed and fully surrendered to Christ. And if you deny the opportunity now, you won't have a chance then. This is your opportunity, you see. In order to present people with the opportunity to accept the truth of Christ for themselves, we must be bold enough to speak His message and invite people to accept Jesus Christ. That's what I'm doing this morning. Notice verse 11. It says He will send them strong delusion. Why? Because verse 10 says they receive not the truth. You're not receiving what I'm saying today. 
There are people sitting on pews all over this country who think they are born again going to heaven and they are not born again. There's people here right now. You think you're born again, you are not. If that wasn't the case, I wouldn't be preaching like this. I wouldn't feel this. I wouldn't have been given this today. And what I'm telling you is that if you reject it now, and I'm not saying not coming to church. I'm not saying you didn't say a prayer. I'm saying rejecting it by your life and the way you live with habitual sin, little foxes spoiling the vine, things that separate you from God. If that's your life, you're not saved. I'm telling you what this says. You've rejected the truth that you might be saved. And because of that, here's what God's going to do. He's not going to give you an opportunity during the tribulation period. He's going to send you strong delusion that you will believe a lie. That's why Jesus said in the Gospels, he said, the very elect during this time will be deceived. Have you ever thought about what that means? That means those whom he has elected to hear the gospel now, that chose to reject it now, will be deceived then. Because he says it here, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. After God's restraining influence is taken out of the way, which is the church, listen, and the lawless one is revealed, people who have received not the love of the truth that they might be saved will come under a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. As a result, they will be eternally lost. First off, these people will consist of all those inside or outside the church who after adequately hearing the truth of God's word have intentionally refused to love the truth and have chosen to instead delight in worldly wickedness and worldly pleasure. You say, well, I'm not that bad. Well, lukewarm's worse than being that bad. That's why he said the lukewarm church, he will spew and person out of his mouth. Secondly, God will give these people over to a powerful delusion or deception so that they never again have an opportunity to believe the truth they refuse to accept and love. And they will forever be doomed to believe a lie. I hear people, I've heard it. Well, if I don't make the rapture, I got a chance. You won't have a chance. Even if you live during that day, even if you live after planes fall out of the sky, after cars whose drivers are ejected in the rapture hit head on other cars, and there's chaos and mayhem, police officers who have been raptured, and, and government leaders, world will be in tremendous chaos. If you make it through that day, you will not have the opportunity to say yes to Christ because He will give you strong delusion. God sending the strong delusion is part of His judgment on those who reject the truth. It is assurance that they might be damned. Folks, I don't care what any backslidden preacher has said. Hell is real. Hell is real fire. It's not just separation from God. It's real fire where you will have your five senses. You'll be able to see. You'll be able to taste. You'll be able to feel. You'll be able to, to experience all these things in a place called hell. And you'll always, Jesus said it like this. He said, this is the place where the worm dies not. Do you know what that means? That means your memory, your soul will never die. You'll have a remembrance of sitting in a congregation like this with the opportunity to say yes to Christ and fully surrender your heart and life. And you'll remember that you rejected it. That's hell. Knowing that you'll never have another chance. This is your chance. There's nothing worth not having Christ in your life. Amen. Nothing. I'm telling you, that Powerball is $1.9 billion. They could burn it for all I care. If it meant I couldn't have Him. I mean it. I mean it. Eternity away from God is not worth anything. Why? That's why Jesus said, what will a man gain if he gains the whole world yet loses his own soul? What shall he profit if he loses his soul? What will he give in exchange for his soul? Oh, Lord, help us. Go to Hebrews 10. I want to read this passage to you, and I'm going to narrow this thing down here. I'm not trying to scare you to death. <laughs> well, maybe I am. I mean, 
Jude did say, hey, pull them from the fire with fear, right? <laughs> I guess that's what I'm doing. I can't help but do it. Because I would hate to think that I've been given this responsibility to preach to you and bring you God's Word and to stand before Him and say you did it half-hearted. You gave them what they wanted to hear, not what I told you to say. I want Him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. If that means it costs me a big church and a lot of money, so be it. I'll walk on the streets of gold knowing I've been faithful to my Master, my Maker, my Lord, and my Savior. And that's all I'm concerned about at this point in my life. Because I've had nice things and a little bit of money in my pocket. And I want to tell you, it, it's not that great. But when you stop, in fact, you know what? I was thinking about this last night. I was watching the World Series. We talked about going to that thing. I watched this guy hit a 450-foot home run. Astros win. And I said, you know what? And I thought about, I went to a church last Sunday and half the crowd was gone. And the preacher said, well, they got travel baseball. I said, dear God, I said, how many parents are training their children that baseball and sports and soccer and basketball are more important than the house of God at the most impressionable time in their lives? And it's happening all over the country. Now, I'm not condemning you. I'm trying to make you feel bad. I played ball growing up. But my thought when I was thinking was, you know, I won, we were on three state championship baseball teams. I doubt any of your kids will ever experience that. And chances are they won't go pro in anything. That's just the chances of it. Right? We were good and I was good. But you know, I don't remember hardly anything about that. It's like an all blur memory. But let me tell you what I do remember. I remember standing in an altar at 12 years old and the Holy Ghost coming upon my life, calling me to preach the gospel. I've never forgotten how well and how good that felt. Hallelujah. And when He touches me now, I can remember the day, the spot, the hour that He changed my life forever. I'm telling you, parents, the best thing you could do for your children is bring them to the house of God and show them to love the truth of the Word of God. Hebrews 10, let me read it. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another <laughs> so much more as you see that day approaching. What day is that? That's the day of the Lord. That's what I'm talking about. He's saying you better get together more. The ironic thing, the American church gets together less. The deception has already started. It's already begun. Verse 26, for if we willfully, oh, well, I'd love to hear one of these modern preachers preach on this, wouldn't you? If we willfully sin after we have received the knowledge of the truth, that's those who have been born again, said yes to Christ, He's changed your life, but now you've made the decision to willfully sin. After you've received it, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. He's not saying you can't be forgiven of it. He's just saying that you're doing yourself a disservice because the only way to joy and happiness and a future in eternity is in Christ and His sacrifice. And when you willfully sin, you're saying it's not good enough. Verse 27, But a certain fearful expectation of judgment. And a fierceness of fire which shall devour the adversaries. That's what's waiting on the guy and the gal that willfully sins, which leads to death, which will lead you to separation from God. Let me just correct a lie for you. I know you've heard preachers say, once you're saved, you're always saved. You're sealed to the day of redemption. Yeah, that's if. You place your faith continually in the Son of God. But if you willfully sin, it will lead to death. That's the truth of God's Word. In fact, verse 37 of Hebrews 10, I didn't give it to him, but I'm going to read it. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and he will not tarry. That's Jesus. He's coming. Now the just shall live by, shout it, faith. But if any man... Nobody quotes this part. I hear him quote all that. The just shall live by faith. 
But here's what it says. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. <sighs> so it's possible. But we are not of them who draw back under perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. I want that to be us today. Come on, amen. amen. I don't want to be the person that's left behind when the church is taken out of this earth. Because then you, sitting here today, will not have a chance. Because you're hearing it right now. That Christ is the only way. Let me close. Verse 13 of 2 Thessalonians 2. After he says there will be damned who believe not the truth. Had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always. Let me... Lord, help me. I cannot stand here and emphasize to you enough that you must continually become a living sacrifice unto the Lord. I can't. I, maybe you haven't seen how easy it is to draw back, to backslide, to fall away. You miss one Sunday, you miss three. And then you find yourself not even attending at all. You miss one day of scripture reading. You had not read it in months. I'm not preaching a works-based salvation. I'm telling you that if you're saved, you will work. That if you're producing saving faith, it's going to produce fruit that shows, hey, I'm born again. And if it's not, you're not born again. That's not Gary, because that's the word of God. See? Verse 13, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. He's chosen you to hear it today. He's chosen you to say yes to the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made at Calvary's cross so that you could be forgiven and free and saved from the judgment that is already beginning in this earth. Look around you. Look around you. You think this stuff's going to get better? Probably not. <laughs> I hope it does, but probably not. And we have to face the reality that Jesus is coming. He's coming. He's coming. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle, now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. How does it happen? By surrendering your life. Stand with me, would you? Every head bowed, every eye closed. No music yet. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Don't let this day pass you by. If you're trying to talk yourself into thinking that you're born again, I'm talking to you. If you're wondering in your mind, is this for me? Then it is. I could tell you it was for me this week. There's little foxes spoiling the vine in my life that I've got to get out of my life. I've got to cut arms off, pluck eyes out. I've got to do it. I've got to do it because I don't want to miss the rapture of the church. I don't want to miss it. Because if I do, I don't have a chance. And neither will you. The only people be saved during that time are those who didn't have an adequate opportunity. Those people in other parts of the world that the gospel isn't as prevalent as it is right here in America. They're here at one day. <laughs> They'll have 144,000 Jewish evangelists preaching the gospel during this time of tribulation. Two witnesses that will declare the goodness of God. Angels shouting the gospel. And the Bible says multitudes will come to Christ. And the church, the bride, will be in the throne room of heaven, being partakers of the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's where I want to be. I don't want to be left behind knowing that I had the opportunity, but I blew it. Because there's no redemption after that. And teenagers, I'm talking to you today. I'm talking to everybody in this building. If you understand what I'm saying, you're held accountable to what I'm saying. 
and he will hold you accountable. Those watching, I'm talking to you. He's holding you accountable because today is the day of salvation. And harden not your heart, but come to Christ. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want you to examine your heart. And if this is the message the Holy Spirit has given you today, and you want to fully surrender your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to come. Sure, come on. I want you to come. With a no care what anybody thinks attitude, doesn't matter. They're not going to stand with you during that time. I want you to come. If there's little foxes spoiling the vine, come on. You can kneel, stand, whatever you'd like. This is for you today. If sin has come into your life and you know it, and you've overlooked it, you've turned a blind eye to it, this is for you. This is for you. If the Holy Spirit is convicting your heart, and he's saying today is the day, <laughs> oh, the rapture could happen today, and this could be your last chance, your last opportunity. Come on, I ask you, would you come? Chris, would you come and just play something, just strum something? And let those who would like to come, come. I'm going to leave this open for just a minute. Sure, come on. Come on, guys. Come stand right here. Listen, I'm standing with you. Everybody up here, I'm part of this. If this was preached to me today, I'd be running to this altar. Because I want to be in that departure. I want to be in that rapture. I don't want to be left behind here. I don't want to spend eternity in a place called hell. My decision, my mind is made up today. I'm going to serve God with all my heart. I'm going to completely surrender my life to Jesus Christ. And I'm going to know with a surety that I belong to God. I'm going to know. We all fall short of the glory of God, but if we're willfully doing it, we need to repent. And I repent today. Would you come? Amen. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, every person that's here who has answered this call, you forgave them the moment they took the first step in obedience. And right now, we just <laughs> simply... Look to you, the author and finisher of our faith. We don't want to be the people that draw back. We don't want to be the people that backslide. We definitely don't want to be the people that apostatize. And allow the flesh, the world, wickedness to take the place of our relationship with you. We want to be part of your family today. And Lord, you said, as you told the believers, if we confess that you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And today, I would ask that you would cleanse every person here who is saying in full surrender, I want the Lord Jesus Christ. I reject the world. I reject the flesh. I will not be left behind. I will not come under strong delusion, but I will believe the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and He is the truth, the way, truth, and life today. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for sealing us because we've made the decision to stand firmly in the hand of God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen.